Well, hello there, and welcome to this episode of The Terry Cole Show. So this is part two. So if you missed part one, which is all about high-functioning codependency, what it is and what the cost is, and this is part two, where I'm going to talk about HFC recovery. I'm going to talk about some things you can do, some archetypes to see if you can find yourself in the HFC world, and actually I'm giving you some tools and strategies of things that you can do to start to do these unhealthy behaviors less. So before we get into it, if you happen to be new to my YouTube channel, introduce yourself, say hello, because we are friendly. Please make sure that you subscribe and make sure you hit the bell so that when I roll out something new, which is every Tuesday and every Thursday, that you get notified, because really, I'm doing it for you. Might as well get notified. Thank you so much for all your questions and comments. I love to highlight them. This is from the Keldify. And this is under the video, How Emotional Maturity Creates Better Relationships. Terry, I found so much value in just this one video. Truly eye-opening for me. I found your YouTube channel a week or so ago. I can't stop watching them. Everyone I watch is doing for me what so many other counselors, videos, books have not. It is literally changing my life moment by moment. Wow, I'm feeling a little verklempt from that. That really warms my heart. Thank you so much for taking the time to write that note. It really matters to me because really, you guys, you're it for me. You're, you're why I do it. So when I know that it's helping you, that it's uh, helping you lessen your own suffering, wow, that really brings joy to my heart. So thank you. All right, let's move it on into today's content. So part two is what today is about high-functioning codependency. So if you missed part one, I want you to watch that first because that explains what high-functioning codependency is, why I coined that phrase, why I'm writing an entire book about high-functioning codependency. And today we're going to talk about different archetypes of high-functioning codependency because just like boundaries, right, how boundaries, you can have disordered boundaries but have different styles. You could either be like the peacekeeper, the pushover, or you could be like the ice queen, which is more rigid boundaries. This is similar in that Not all high-functioning codependents present the exact same way, right? Because we're all different people. But we do have some things in common. Let's talk about archetypes first, and then I'm going to move into things that you can do. All right, so the first archetype I want to talk about is the director. And this is someone who's highly capable. It could be your sister, your friend, who finds the best place for you guys to go on vacation, is super quick with advice, auto advice giving all the time. A great problem solver. Also kind of bossy. Everything is kind of black and white. She's a little bit like Judge Judy. She deems herself as the one who knows what's right and wrong, for sure. She's loyal and amazing, but she would also sooner ghost you or sort of be withdrawn in anger than tell you that you hurt her feelings. So there's an inflexibility around the director, and her boundaries are too tight. They're too rigid. So people might say that she's controlling. They might see that right from afar. And she's really trying to dictate her influence outcomes to reduce her own anxiety and fear of uncertainty, whether it's with her kids or whomever. What is the shadow of this? They can be judgmental and bossy and will get annoyed or angry if their directives are not followed or their advice not given. Then you have the entertainer. And that's the funny friend who uses humor and flattery or expert storytelling to manage the feeling states of others and keep everything light, right? Doesn't, doesn't want anything to be too heavy. This friend might also ask questions and simultaneously provide their preferred hyper positive answer. For example, oh, are you loving your new job, Jill? It sounds amazing, right? Like it's not how is your new job, it's are you loving it? I had a friend who would be like, Oh, how's your sister, Tara? She's doing good, right? I'm like, why are you asking? (laughs) You clearly don't actually want to know because she's not doing well. The entertainer is highly capable, but conflict avoidant, right? So this can negatively impact their personal and um, professional relationships. Very adept at going along to get along. But I also feel like with the entertainer, sometimes they can confuse compliance with compatibility in relationships. A lot of times the entertainer's boundaries are too loose. They're too porous. And, you know, even though she's very well-liked, usually this archetype, 
The people experience her as fun and charming and funny. Inside, she's really tired from too much self-sacrificing and managing others to keep the peace. So the shadow for this archetype is can be a chameleon in relationships, right, to avoid conflict. So she's not really deeply known by others, which can be really painful, right? Her need to find the silver lining in all situations can also be frustrating and off-putting to others. Then you have the hyper helper. This is the friend who can't stop helping others. She's an equal opportunity helper. Friends, family, strangers alike, doesn't care. She's dialed all the way in to any need in her vicinity, right? So she may be in a helping profession, profession like nursing, therapy, coaching, teaching. She will do things for people that they ask her to do and things that they do not ask her to do because she's always doing. She will lend you her truck, throw the random guy she just met in a new job or retirement party because nobody else was doing it, lend you money even if she has very little. So her boundary style is porous, right? Again, too loose because she's unintentionally stepping over, right? She's overstepping the boundaries of others in her hyper helping mania, as I call it. Helping others is a compulsion because she can't not do it. It causes her too much anxiety. So you can imagine the shadow on this is that her personal relationships and health may suffer from her nonstop helping. It's exhausting, right? She can also get annoyed and feel used even if no one's asked her for help, like sort of feeling like people aren't really grateful enough. Then you have the auto accommodator, right? And this is the friend who, when you're in the grocery store on the 15 items or less line and you have 10 items, someone behind you has two. She reflexively, without even missing a beat, just not even interrupting, just lets, guides the other person to step in front of you, right? Signals them to go ahead. She'll move and let the couple on the pack train sit together, cancel her weekend plans to spend time with a brokenhearted pal. She's efficient, she's capable, always unconsciously scanning for trouble brewing so she can ward it off. Again, her boundaries are also porous, meaning too loose, because many times she's inserting her solution to a problem that only she is seeing, like no one else is seeing it. So her shadow side there is her ability to see exactly what is needed in any situation can make her judgmental of those who don't see that. Then you have the perfectionist. And this is the friend who does it all right, sends all the flowers for the birthdays, is extremely thoughtful. Every aspect of her life is optimized and streamlined, right? There's no room for error for her or for anyone else. So she has impeccable taste. She goes the extra mile, creates extraordinary experiences, whether it's dinner for 12 or planning a perfect wedding. Her bar is way above striving for excellence. It's more in the zone of an unrelenting expectation that she will always say and do the right and perfect things and achieve her many goals, but she's likely exhausted, although you wouldn't know it from how she looks because she is super pulled together. And she's also a harsh critic of others who aren't perfect, which can be really painful. So the shadow is that she can be judgmental, right, while um, applying her impossible standards to others. So that can be judging kids, judging friends, and become easily frustrated and angry if things don't go as planned. So there's a lack of flexibility and spontaneity in this archetype. And then you have the fixer savior. And these two are basically one. So this is your friend you can call anytime, day or night, right? Say, I need you. And she is literally throwing on her sneakers and jumping in the car or buying a ticket to Mexico or whatever it is that you need. So she is 100% all in until the crisis is over and the mission is accomplished. Incredibly highly capable and makes it her business to know the right people. She will dive into her extensive virtual Rolodex to find the right resources and happily cash in favors that are owed to her on your behalf, right? Highly capable problem solver. Think Olivia Pope from Scandal, right? And she's really fueled by helping others. But there's also something about, this is sort of similar to the hyper helper, where she can't stop fixing or making suggestions, even when nothing is broken. So it can be frustrating to always feel like she's seeking to manage you and your feelings. Okay, you guys, so those are the archetypes. And I wonder if you see yourself in any of them. And you can see the things that they all have in common, right? Where we're overgiving, overfunctioning, overdoing, trying to manage other people, controlling with a capital C or a small c. But really, ultimately, as I said in the last episode, High functioning codependency. There's two things that it's based on. The foundation is disordered boundaries and a covert or overt bid to control other people's outcomes. 
That's pretty much what it is. Now, again, you guys, so much of this is unconscious. That's why I'm writing about it. That's why I'm writing a book about it. That's why I'm talking about it, is that these are not things we're wanting to do, right? I never thought I was being controlling in my 20s when this was happening. I really thought, I swear to you, I really, my heart was in the right place. I thought I was being loving, but what I didn't realize at that age was how averse I was to other people's suffering. That someone else having a messy problem created an unbelievable amount of discomfort in me. Like an un- I couldn't handle it amount. So in order to not feel that discomfort, I would go into action. I would figure out the problem. I would lend people money. I would do whatever whatever it took so that this person that I cared about, and a lot of times it was people I didn't even know that well, I could get really hooked into feeling overly responsible because this is another part of HFC, is feeling overly responsible for the feeling states, the outcomes, the circumstances, the relationships, the problems in other people's lives. It's like their problems become our problems. and. Not in the way that a good friend, right, is there for you if you have a problem. But a good friend who's healthy isn't taking on your problem like it's their own per se, right? They're there with you in the foxhole like, hey, you want to brainstorm? We can figure this out together, okay. But that's not the same as when you're a high-functioning codependent. There is this desire to take over the problem. Can't stop making suggestions. You know, a lot of times people just want to vent, but we don't want them to. We want to solve the problem. Like, why are you complaining about that when there's a way that you can fix it? Just listen to me and fix it, right? There are different things. And part of being on the other side and getting yourself into recovery, because I really do like a high-functioning codependency, like any other kind of compulsive behavior, like addiction, because Until we figure out why we're doing it, we can't not do it. At least I couldn't. I've had hundreds of clients, thousands at this point over the 25 years, who the behavior, we were all on the same page, that the behavior is compulsive, where there was no thought. I didn't have any room between my reaction to that person's situation or their stress and my action. It is literally reacting, not responding. And everything felt like a five alarm, 10 alarm fire for me. Like I needed to help them fix whatever the problem was. And maybe you identify with that as well, but it's exhausting. And you know, as that, what I talked about in the first of this little series, you know, the cost to your health, autoimmune disorders, lack of sleep, TMJ, There are so many ways that being an HFC can negatively impact your health and your relationships. So if you see yourself here in any of these descriptions, first of all, you're not alone, right? You're not alone. This is so real. I'm writing a book about it. I've seen this so many times that I I didn't need to come up with a concept for a book. This was the concept for the book that was continually being seen in my therapy office. And again, it was all the same thing where it was women who didn't identify with the old school definition of codependency. So for me, all I care about is that I want to alert you to this collection of unhealthy, exhausting behaviors that you might be engaging in. I want to give you ways to change your behavior. That's what I care about. So, like, I'm not in this to, like, debate codependency, to not debate it. This is what I saw and what I experienced in myself, that the codependencies that HFCs have also seems to not just be limited to the people that they're in relationships with. It's almost like HFCs, we can become codependent with the world. That is my experience. I could become, feel overly responsible for a perfect, stranger. And I share these stories with you in the book that will be coming out in October. Anyway, so let's move into what you can do. 
instead of auto advice giving, if that's your jam, where someone has a problem and you immediately go to tell them what your opinion, learn to ask expansive questions. What do you think you should do? What does your gut instinct say? If you did know the answer, what would it be? Right? Having faith that other people are more masterful at their own life than we are, and that it's really for them to figure it out. You can be there and you can be loving. And after you ask them those expansive questions, if you want to give your opinion, you can. But my point is we want to stop the auto part of the advice giving. Expansive questions creates deeper intimacy in relationships because you start to get to know what your person thinks, what your child thinks, and even younger kids. You can ask them, what do they think they should do instead of telling them? We we want to teach kids critical thinking skills, right? Yes, we do. Um, Okay, what else do you need to do? You need to up your mindfulness game. Because if we are to create space between how we feel about someone else's problem, right? You may still have that initial feeling of like, oh, fear, maybe. But you don't have to act on it. And if you have a dedicated mindfulness practice, even if it's just meditating once a day for 15 to 20 minutes or 10 minutes, you start to build in that internal space that gives you a breath, that gives you the ability to choose something different, to choose to ask a question instead of giving advice. Another thing that I think is important if you're in the beginning process of understanding high-functioning codependency, because you still have to wait for my book to come out, which is not until October, is get clear on what's not working for you in your life. So that would look like doing a resentment inventory. That would really be a GPS to what relationships are not working and why. And be honest with yourself. You might feel resentful towards someone who isn't appreciative of the things that you do for them, even though they don't ask you to do them. Right? We got to start to get honest with ourselves about the way that we are interacting with the people in our lives? And are we stripping them of their sovereignty and their autonomy by bossing them around like some of these archetypes that we talked about? Another thing that is probably the hardest to do, but one of the most important, is to allow, to accept, to surrender, to start to say yes when people ask you if you need help, to start asking for help when you need help. Surrendering to what is, is one of the hardest things for an HFC to do if the what is, is not the way we want it to be. And again, meditation and mindfulness can help so much here. We really have to learn to let the chips fall where they may, especially when they're not our friggin' chips. And this is what it means to love people. Allow them to have their experiences. Witness them with compassion. Really trying to not control, overtly or covertly. So you guys, in the next X number of months, I'll be talking quite a bit about this, but I wanted to just put this out there and I want to know what your thoughts are. Do you identify with any of the archetypes? I'm creating a quiz right now. It's not ready yet, but when it is, you'll be the first to know. Actually, I'll probably release it with the book, I imagine. But I want to know what your thoughts are on the archetype, so I will include a shortened version of them in the guide, which you can get at terrycole.com forward slash guide. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being here with me. I so appreciate you. I hope you guys have the most amazing week. And as always, take care of you.